After the Buddha gained awakening, he reflected that people who live without something or someone to respect live in misery. We see this all around us. People don't respect the laws anymore. People don't respect one another. And society is miserable. But the Buddha reflected further. Was there someone he could respect, someone he could bow down to? And realized there was nobody he could, because after all he was fully awakened. No one else was nearly there. And then he decided to respect the Dhamma that he had found. Because he recognized that was bigger than he was. The Dhamma is a truth. It's been true all along. There are Buddhists who come along and discover it, teach it to others, and then others just let it go. It disappears. And then another Buddha has to come and fight his defilements, fight his ignorance, to find the Dhamma and fight off the ignorance and defilements of other people to teach them. But the Dharma is always there. It's always true. So we should think about that. What does it mean to respect the Dharma? Because if the Buddha respected the Dharma and we respect him, we should have respect all around. He talks about having respect for the training. There's virtue, concentration, discernment. We should realize these things are above us. These are the kinds of things we submit to. I know in Buddhist circles people don't like the word submit. We're free to choose, right? Well, we are free to choose. But we're free to make a mess of our lives, and we're free to straighten ourselves out, to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, and not in accordance with our preferences. These are choices we're free to make, but it should be pretty obvious what's the wise choice. And so we learn all the ins and outs of the Triple Training and try to have respect for them. And it's a way of showing respect for ourselves, because after all, the Dharma is there to teach us how to find true happiness how to stop creating the mess in our lives that we've been creating, how to stop creating the suffering for ourselves and for other beings that we've been creating. If we could say that the Dharma had an intention, its intention is more compassionate for us than oftentimes we are for ourselves. So we should take it seriously. All the precepts were laid down by the Buddha. He didn't make them up. He observed from his own experience over many, many aeons that when people break the five precepts, they create trouble for themselves, trouble for other people. When people engage in wrong speech, some of the forms of which don't come under the precept against lying, but they certainly fall outside of the path. Harsh speech, divisive speech, idle chatter. The Buddha was very particular about speech. If you look through the Jataka tales, you'll see that the Buddha had to be, as he's portrayed in those tales, will sometimes break the precepts, except for one. It never breaks the precept against lying. This is one of the reasons why he was able to find the truth, because he was very devoted to telling the truth. You start lying to yourself, lying to other people, and the truth gets harder and harder to find. In fact, of all the precepts, this is the one that he 
underscore it the most. He said, a person who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie, there's no evil that person will not do. That person is empty of the qualities of a contemplative. He raised the issue of not lying, very first thing when he taught his son, Rahula. The practice begins there. Only when that's firmly established, you're really ready for the higher levels. If that's not established, it can spoil the higher levels. You can get the mind into concentration, but it gets spoiled. You can try to develop discernment, but it gets spoiled. This is one of the reasons why the forest tradition is so strict about the precepts, because they are the foundation. And as with building a house, if the foundation is cracked, the house is not going to stand. So we start with respect for the precepts. We place them above our desires to do or say or act on intentions as we like. It's because we have that willingness to submit to the Dharma that we're going to learn it. This goes on into concentration. As we live with one another, we we'll go through the day. We have to remember that concentration is not something you do only when you sit here with your eyes closed or you're on your meditation path. You want to maintain your center as you engage in all of your activities. And be very careful to watch out for the things that will knock you off. Sometimes it's the things that other people do or say, and more often it's the things you do or say yourself, or think yourself. So if you find that certain ways of acting shatter your concentration, you've got to step back and say, well, maybe I should stop acting in those ways. Remember the Buddha's image of the man walking with a bowl of oil on his head? He doesn't want to spill a single drop. And John Lee's image is of carrying food in a dish. You want to make sure you don't trip and spill the food, because then it gets down in the dirt and you can't eat it anymore. So have respect for your own concentration. And have respect for the concentration of other people. If you have issues with them, try to speak in a way that you're not shaking their concentration more than it has to be has to be shaken. The ways that are you can talk with one another, and you can show respect, and that's the big issue: showing respect for others, even when you're being critical. That makes a difference between whether they'll be willing to listen or not, and also will have an effect on their concentration and on your concentration. So respect the fact that you're living with people who are trying to get their minds under control. And you want to help. And there's respect for discernment. This is directly related. When you see that a certain type of behavior muddies the mind. You have to realize, how are you going to get, get into discernment when you behave that way and the mind gets muddied? You have to behave in such a way that you can see things clearly. Now, this relates both to the concentration and to the virtue. If you do things that are open, honest, and above board, then it's easier to remember them. If the mind is still, it's easier to see. This is what we want. We want the discernment that allows us to see into our minds. So the way we show respect for discernment is to make sure that the causes for discernment are in place. As for other agendas you may have as you go through the day, we'll look at them. A lot of our 
our agendas have to do with conceit, wanting to be respected by other people, getting upset when they don't respect us. But you have to ask yourself, do you want your ears to be like big sails that are blown around by every little breath of wind? That's what conceit is. You're constantly looking for other people's respect or lack of respect for you. You have to realize that's their business. And although we respect everybody to, <coughs> excuse me, we request everybody to respect one another, there will be times when it's not happening. That's when you've got to defend yourself. So take down your sails. When something comes up, you ask yourself, what would be the wise way of responding to that, rather than just your old habitual way of responding? And that mindfulness will give you an opportunity for the discernment to arise. Because oftentimes it's not the case that we don't know, it's just that in the heat of the moment we forget, or we push it out of our minds. And that's not showing respect for discernment. So the training is there. It's been laid out. The Buddha discovered it. It might have been lost by people before him. And someday it's going to be lost again. But we've got the path available now. And as we take it on, we benefit. So you have to ask yourself, are you going to just stick with your old habits, your old ways of doing things? Or are you going to submit your habits to another set of standards, a higher set of standards, a more well-established set of standards? As the Buddha said, he taught that skillful qualities could be developed, unskillful qualities could be abandoned. If they couldn't be developed and abandoned. He wouldn't have taught. It's because we can change our habits that he went to all the trouble of teaching. To so remind yourself that's what the practice of the Dharma is for, it's to change your habits. Because the habits you've got right now are creating suffering. And you're free to continue creating suffering, but, but why? When the opportunity to stop is there. Sometimes the response to why is apathy, you don't care, or heedlessness, you're not really paying attention, or laziness, you don't want to be bothered. But you've given into these habits for a long time. That's a, that's a triple training you don't want to get involved with, you don't want to submit to. You've submitted to it long enough. By submitting to virtue, the practice of concentration, the development of discernment, you offer yourself some better opportunities. The opening for those opportunities is here and now. How much longer it will be open, who knows. But take advantage of it while you can.